car crash cases, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by Hollis Wright and Couch, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts. The attorneys with Josh Wright from the Hollis Wright and Couch Law Firm and host David Lamb. Hello and welcome in to the attorneys. We appreciate you spending your Sunday evening with us for the next half hour. What we're going to try to do is get some experts together to answer the questions you have. For that to take place, you need to get your questions to us throughout the program. You'll see ways that you can call, text, or email. You get the questions to us and we'll be glad to pass them along uh, for the next half hour here on the attorneys. Leading the conversation tonight, as he often does, Josh Wright of the firm Hollis Wright and Couch. Good to see you, sir. You too. Hope you had a great week. Indeed. You know, David, this is a, a, a topic that is, is very relevant. Um, the FDA reports uh, 100,000 injuries a year uh, associated with medical devices. Wow. Staggering statistics. It is. Uh, we're going to be talking about defective medical devices, and um, uh, when, when we do that at my firm, uh, we've, we've got two folks at our firm that really handle these cases. One is Bo Bell, and we've got Bo here today. Uh, Bo handles a, a lot of our mass tort department, uh, is involved actively in litigating and in leadership uh, across the country in uh, litigating these cases. And uh, so when we need to go to the experts, this is one of the guys oh, we go to. Guy. So glad to have you on. Thank you. Bo, good, to good to see you again. You uh, too. First of all, just kind of give us an overview. What, what are we talking about? Help us understand the medical devices in question. Okay, sure. Uh, when we're talking about medical devices, it's basically any instrument that was designed to help aid or treat um, any type of health-related issue. Some examples would be and the ones that we're kind of seeing mostly right now are your knee implants, your hip implants. Um, there's another uh, mesh type uh, a product that is uh, people are talking about a lot. You know, but it also can be some of the more simple things like the tools I use to put these things in. Um, it, it's a really a large term, mm -hmm. and you know, when they're working properly, they really do help millions of people. Uh, but you know, if things go wrong, there, you know, can be traumatic injuries that have to, you know. That these people end up suffering. This is a two hundred billion dollar a year industry. It's a huge industry, yeah, and there are companies all over the world that are providing medical devices and products that go into our bodies and are used for uh, medical surgeries and whatnot across the country. So it's a huge industry, um, and you know, really not what we're talking about today is is not so much um, those medical devices that are working great. It is some of the companies that are coming in to provide medical devices that are not going through the appropriate process necessary to make sure that what they're using and what they're putting in your body is a bad thing for you. Who, who does the regulating? If, if we're talking th those amounts of dollars, I'm sure there are plenty of companies trying to get involved in that game. Yeah. So who, who does the regulation? The FDA uh, is in charge of regulating all medical devices um, and they have different processes which they can approve, be approved. Right. And, and it, it, just to kind of follow up on that, you, you've really got two different processes that are used sure. to approve medical devices. One, a more stringent test than the other. Maybe explain that because I think okay. that's important. Sure, this is important. Um, there are two ways the device gets approved. One of them is called the pre-market approval process. Um, we usually say PMA for short. And this came about in 1976. Before 1976, the FDA really didn't have any ability to look at the design and the components and how it's manufactured a device. It was really just about you know, approving something to be marketed. So in 76, they came out with a pre-market approval process, and it's very stringent. You have to do clinical studies. You have to do reports. I mean, they look at every aspect of this device to approve it. Mm -hmm. And you know, even though that it is very strange like that, unfortunately, some devices still get through that end up failing. Um, the other way is called and it's referencing a federal regulation, it's 510K, or pre-market notification. And it's, the best way to explain it is kind of like grandfathering in. Basically, a device can be approved today with none of that, none of the testing, none of the studies, um, without looking at how it's made or the components, by showing or, or by coming to the FDA and saying, look, this really isn't a new device. Mm -hmm. This is su substantially equivalent to a device that was already on the market prior to 1976. And if they can show that and the FDA agrees, yeah, this is really just something that already was on the market, then they are allowed to um, approve it. And when I say substantially equivalent, it doesn't have to be the exact same thing. Uh, an example would be these uh, transvaginal mesh cases we're taking. 
the uh, the argument was that we already used mesh mm -hmm. prior to. It didn't mean they used it in that manner, but surgical mesh has been around forever. So all we're doing is, is we're presenting a product that's surgical mesh. Mm -hmm. And they got approved without having to see how it will function when it's used in the manner that the transvaginal mesh is used. And I think Bo hit it perfectly. The, the, the cliff note on that whole deal is the 510K process is a less invasive process for the manufacturer and designer of the product to be able to get it to market, whereas the PMA process is going to be kind of like um, uh, drugs go through uh, when, when, when you hear of a new drug that's hit the market that's a brand name drug. It's gone through a tremendous amount of research and development to make sure that it's tested on people before it's marketed through the FDA as, and, and approved through the FDA. Uh, that PMA process is a much more stringent process. Um, and, and David, there have been some real interesting developments in the legal world related to those two types of uh, processes that are used, the PMA more stringent process and the grandfathering process, pro, um, process called the 510K. Um, basically the Supreme Court has come out in the last several years an opinion that is widely known as called the Regal Opinion. And in short, um, the U.S. Supreme Court has determined that any case um, where somebody has gone through the PMA process, they've gone through the stringent process, if the medical device causes injury, um, the claim is preempted, which means that really in layman terms, you're not allowed to bring a claim related to those medical devices that are defective, whereas those that have been through the 510K process, the less stringent process, you can still litigate those cases if you've been um, uh, injured by a medical device that went through that process. And I think I hit that correctly. You did. Uh, that's exactly true. And unfortunately, as I said, even though the PMA process covers every aspect of the device, some get through. Uh, there were a number of heart stent cases that were filed around 2008 when this uh, uh, opinion came out and as soon as the opinion came out they had to be dismissed because that device went through the pre-market approval process. Regardless though that it caused injuries, people had been seriously injured, you lost your rights to bring a case against it. People are trying to get around that and it's been very minimal success. Mm -hmm. um, so it really does leave you, uh, leave a, a large segment of the population without any recourse. Not unlike um, where I've been on the show before discussed generic drugs where you can't go after them you know, it's not the same theory, but it basically ends up in the same result. Right. A question we've got here, if no testing is required, are there still devices that go through the 510K process? Absolutely. Um, and that's, you know, I kind of touched on this. Um, going back to some of the cases we're handling, uh, the, the hip cases, these metal on metal hip cases you're seeing these commercials for, they were able to get approved without any of this pre-market approval process because they had used metal metal hips before prior to 1976. They stopped using it because they realized this is a problem and for whatever reason probably in the early 2000s it became the new hot thing again. Metal metal is going to be stronger. It's better for younger people. It will last longer. Well guess what it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how they got through. Said hey this is not something new. You already had allowed this before. This is substantially equivalent and they got um, put in. And just like the mesh I mentioned. They've used mesh, surgical mesh forever. Now they're just bringing it back and putting it in a different place and they didn't have to go through that testing. There is so much, uh, there are a lot of products that are getting through that way that is causing, it, so many recalls are being uh, surrounding these type of products that there is a lot of heat that maybe this loophole should be closed. Yeah. yeah. All right, time for our first break of the evening. As we head to break, I want to remind you, I'd love to hear from you. You can call, text, email, that information you see right there. Also, find the firm of Hollis Wright & Couch. Just search Hollis Wright & Couch. Find them on Facebook or Hollis underscore Wright. Find them on Twitter. Stay tuned. More attorneys coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright and & Couch, and thanks for watching The Attorneys on Alabama's 13. Now, we hope you, a friend, or a loved one never need legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple. Provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free, so if you have questions specific to this show or related to other civil legal matters, call, email, or text us to talk with one of our lawyers. You can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter to learn about important legal news that could affect you or your family. Or simply contact us by going to alabamas13.com and click on the attorney's link. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us and for watching the attorneys right here on Alabama's 13.
the attorneys want to encourage you for the remainder of this program to get in touch with us. You can call, text, email, even while this discussion uh, continues on, talking about defective medical devices. Yesterday, met with a, an old friend who recently had both knees replaced. Yep. Imagine the pain. Sure. I mean, he, it was just, just weeks ago. Uh, he's kind of at that point. He probably should be ahead in terms of recovery and kind of just not sure, is it, well, is it me? Is it the device? Is it, do I go back? That whole point, how, how do you determine when, or maybe how does the FDA or, or even the courts determine how products, how medical devices are defective? Is it pretty clearly defined? Well, I, I think it's pretty clearly defined, David, but, you know, here's a statistic. One of the quarters in 2012, 123 million devices nationally were recalled. All right, so a lot of times it comes through. My friend's a, not excited about that statistic. Well, that's fair. All. You know what? And his yeah. knees may have no problems whatsoever. Yeah. And again, you know, we, we always try and get across on the show. We're not saying every medical device sure. that's in your body, my body, the, a viewer's body is defective. That's yeah. not the case at all. The, the, the problem is, is some of these manufacturers are rushing to market as quick as they can without the appropriate testing necessary to make sure that the device is evaluated from all aspects all potential people that will be uh, using the product uh, to make sure that it's safe. And when you recall these products, that's really the first step that uh, people need to monitor. And there are ways to, to monitor it. I mean, number one, talk with your doctor. Right. The doctors get letters from these manufacturers when the products are recalled. Um, you know, a little unknown fact, uh, whenever a device is put in your body, uh, in the surgery or the operative report, there's going to be a serial number or a SKU number that identifies the, the product, the manufacturer, um, uh, which version was put in, uh, whether it's you know in your ear, yeah. um, uh, in some type of uh, 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 recall. Um, it, we, you'd be able to determine that, and we've looked at a couple of those cases, knee cases, hip cases. We're going to be able to know based on the operative report. But the concept should not be, I've got a new medical device in my, my body, it, it, you know, and, and I'm concerned it's not working appropriately. The reality is most of this stuff comes through recalls of devices that have been defective in some way and have been determined to be defective. Um, and, and that's how most of these cases start. Maybe it's my age, but there seems to be... A, a the popularity of hip replacements, knee replacements, a whole lot of that. And um, are the, Do you guys have some real-world examples of, of, of how um, it, it either a defective problem, uh, a product, and, and how that came about? Uh, well, sure. Um, one of the cases we're working on are hips that you mentioned, and I might have touched on this a little bit, but it was a device that it was metal on metal. It was the new rage saying, you know, with younger people, if we do metal and metal because they're stronger and we use these bigger metal heads and these cups that go into your hip space, they're going to be better. They're going to last forever. Well, it turns out when these things, when that metal ball grinds in that metal cup, it starts releasing what's called chromium and cobalt ions throughout the body. And what people are experiencing now are things such as pseudotumors and infections. And also, it's, you know, it's causing the device to loosen and fail. Um, so that was another thing where they came out thinking that this was going to be better um, although technically, as I mentioned, they should have looked back in the past when we stopped using them before and right. said there was an issue there. But you know, here's what will happen: one company will come out with something, and they're so competitive, the other one wants to come out with it. Sure. So almost every knee uh, hip manufacturer all came out with their metal and metal product mm -hmm. because they did not want to be the only one. When you're talking to a doctor, when the salesman is talking to the doctor, you don't want to say, "I got the only metal, metal right. is the best." Uh, everyone else wants to say theirs is the best too. So unfortunately, you had hundreds of thousands of people who got this device were told it was the Cadillac right. of hips. It was the best way to, to do this, and it turns out, no, it's not. I mean, the FDA has gotten heavily involved in this. Um, they've questioned the whole theory around metal metal, and unfortunately, you're going to see, um, as slowly, they're getting recalled. Um, the big recall was in 2010. It was the Pew ASR, and again, metal metal. Now, there are some cases that we're pursuing that the recall hasn't occurred, uh, that would be the Depew Pinnacle, but it's still a medical, uh, metal and metal device. We believe that eventually it probably will be recalled, and even if not, we know that that type of design is uh, defective. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think at the end of the day, that, that's a good example of how that case started. It started through uh, a recall, and ultimately when the product was evaluated, uh, I think people recognized uh, th th this is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And um, now what you'll see is because so many companies rush to market to try and provide a similar type product, 
Um, there are other manufacturers out there that have similar products that may ultimately be recalled. And again, we're not saying every product's going to be recalled. Mm -hmm. But the key is talk with your doctor. If you've got concerns or high incidence of failure, uh, talk with your doctor and try and determine whether or not uh, you've got a component in you that may have some problems. Yeah, question we've got here. What types of claims are brought against a defective device? The, usually it's three basic uh, types of claims. One's going to be your design defect and in that you're saying that it was manufactured properly, the warnings were adequate, but it was just the true, the, the design, the, the way it was made is deemed to be defective and that goes back to the metal metal uh, hips. You know, they, they made them okay in the factory. Um, the warnings, you know, might be questionable, but you know, for this, we'll say the warnings were adequate or were fine, but it's that metal of metal. It, it, it is, the pure design of it is incompatible. It should not be working that way and it's going to cause problems no matter how you used it. You could not use this safely without it having an issue. Um, the other type is going to be looking at manufacturing defects and that would be a situation where an example would be something at the facility, uh, contamination. You know, the FDA will go in, um, probably don't do as much as they should, but they go into where they manufacture these types of uh, devices and they make sure that it's you know, sterile and hygiene. Unfortunately, you'll hear a lot of cases where they'll have to recall a hip because for some reason things weren't sterile in, mm -hmm. in the manufacturing process and they got put in someone's body and right. they got MRSA. Um, so that's another type of claim you would, you would bring, that it was manufactured defectively. Um, whether just one unit had some type of, they were off by specs or however you want to say it, or all the units were contaminated due to not keeping up with the, the facility. And the third would be your marketing or warning. Um, you have to warn about the risk that these things pose, not unlike drugs. You've got to say, hey, you put this in your body, here's what could possibly happen. And if you fail to actually give adequate warnings, then you could be held liable. Um, so usually when we will file a case, it is going to probably be all three right. um, because even with a recall, it doesn't automatically tell you exactly what it is. So sometimes you have to find out later, and you would probably go with all three. Yeah. Time for our second uh, break of the evening. Again, as we do so, reminders of ways you can get in touch with the attorneys and our panel of experts. Also, find the firm of Hollis Wright and Couch. Search that term on Facebook. You'll find them at Hollis underscore Wright. To find them on Twitter, stay tuned. The final segment of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright and & Couch, and if you've ever served on a jury, you may have wondered why there are gaps in the evidence you're given. In tonight's Legal 411, we're answering the question, is there insurance to pay the verdict awarded? Know this, just because the lawyers never mention insurance in trial doesn't mean there is not insurance to pay a verdict. Rule 411 of the Alabama Rules of Evidence states this, Evidence that a person was or was not insured against liability is generally not admissible or allowed to be discussed at trial in front of the jury. The reason for the rule is simple. A jury could award more money in a case if they knew the defendant had insurance to pay for it. But the reality in our state is this. In almost all lawsuits that get to trial, insurance is there to pay judgments awarded by the jury. For example, all automobiles in Alabama are required to have liability insurance. Coverage can range from $25,000 up to $1 million. So in theory, all car crash cases that get to trial should have insurance available to pay any verdict awarded by the jury. Trucks have to carry as much as $750,000 up to $5 million worth of insurance. Unfortunately, you'll never hear that during trial because the rules just don't allow it. And even in medical malpractice cases, the doctor or medical professional has liability insurance to help pay a judgment. That's something you won't hear during trial because the rules generally don't allow such testimony. Yet almost all judgments against the medical professional involve liability insurance. Please remember your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Riding Couch want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. And as always, thanks for watching The Attorneys right here on Alabama's 13.
Welcome back in to our final segment of the attorneys. A few minutes left for you to get your questions into our panel of experts. Uh, a good question here. We talked earlier about how the FDA actually regulates these medical devices. Uh, gentlemen, a question here. If there is a problem with a medical device, what actions can the FDA take? Generally, the FDA can take two primary actions, but I think there are some additional ones we can talk about. Um, safety alerts is one. Well, they will alert the marketplace, including doctors, of potential problems associated with a medical device that there may be an investigation ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, they can also uh, uh, mandate a, a recall. Generally, the way it works is the manufacturer works with the FDA and does what they call a voluntary recall. Um, uh, as opposed to an involuntary recall um, where they are working with the FDA to try and recall the product, provide notice to doctors, provide notice to consumers that may have received the device. Those are the two primary ways that the FDA can get involved and there, there may be some others you see, Bo, in your practice. Um, th that's really kind of how it does usually go. Uh, the FDA once the device manufacturer, here's the thing, the manufacturer is responsible for keeping up with these devices. And if they start getting reports of an issue, they're, they're supposed to tell the FDA, they're supposed to notify the public. And the FDA, you know, if they start seeing this, um, that more and more complaints or adverse reports are being reported about this device, then they will do what he was saying. They'll basically start writing letters to doctors, dear doctor letters. They will say, hey, there might be an issue with this. Or, you know, sometimes they're, they're whistleblowers uh, to come out in the, in the, the, at the device manufacturer right. saying, there's an issue here, we need to stop using this. And I mean, it'll get out to the public somehow. Um, sometimes it's, I don't think it's as clear cut. It needs to, they need a better job of informing people. But that's usually it. And again, they can ask them to voluntarily recall it or they can mandate a recall. The, the, there's, a, there's a process used that we haven't discussed. Um, the, the viewers probably would recognize this though. There's a process used after a product hits the market and starts to be uh, used. Uh, let's call it HIP, for example. If there's a high incidence of failure, um, doctors have a place to report that to. Um, patients have a place to report that to that works its way through the FDA system. And at some point, a red light goes off at the FDA and somebody says, wait a minute, uh, there's a high incidence of failure in this component, much higher than should be happening, and that's where an investigation starts. And a lot of times that's the way it starts, and sometimes it's, it's even worse than that. It is there's a high incidence of, of death or serious injury associated with a product. Um, you know, we're talking about heart stents, other things that have, have come to market over the years. Um, and at the end of the day, that's generally the way the process works and how the FDA figures out there's a problem. And I'd like to add to that, I mean, the problem is our system is really not that great. Um, Britain have a great registry. You get a hip implant, there's a registry that they keep up with how it goes on. Uh, mm -hmm. In Australia is another where they have a hip registry where you get this implant and they monitor how well it goes and all these reports are easily uh, filed. We just aren't really, we don't have a system in place like that. And that's kind of how the Depew ASR, which is the one I talked about, got recalled in 2010, that's kind of where it started. Uh, Australia started seeing this problem through the regist registry and stopped, said, you know, no, no, you can't sell it anymore here. Unfortunately, the Pew said, okay, fine, they stopped selling in Australia and kept selling it here in the United States for another year or so um, because we just don't really have that greater registry. It's something they should be looking at, um, but he's correct in how that comes about. Yeah, if a device is recalled, does it not make sense that it's defective? Mm. Unfortunately not, and in the product world, uh, just because something's recalled does not necessarily mean that it is defective. Um, I think there, there are two issues here. I'll, I'll address one. I'll, Bo, I'll let you address okay. the other. The first really is causation. Just because you have a defective product, um, a medical device that you've got, uh, for example, um, a knee or a hip, does not necessarily mean that the actual defect in that product is what is causing and contributing to your injury. Um, it may be something wholly different than the actual uh, rationale for the recall. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you know, because of uh, excess weight, somebody may have a failure mechanism in a hip that has nothing to do with what yeah. the recall is, that it is you know, a metal toxicity in the body. And, and the metal toxicity in the body has caused uh, a recall, but the person's hip is failing because of a weight issue. So causation is one significant issue whenever you're dealing with these. Um, just because it's recalled doesn't necessarily mean the recall itself is what caused your injury. And that's why you need to get to a lawyer and you need to do it quickly so that the lawyer can properly evaluate the case to determine if the recall is even applicable right. to your condition. And that's correct. And also, in most districts, the fact that there is a recall is not even admissible to prove that the product's defective. Uh, the term is subsequent remedial measure. Basically, if there's an injury and someone does something, some type of remedial step to make sure that injury doesn't occur again, 
uh, which would be a hit fails, the company decides to pull it so no one, it won't keep failing for everybody else. I, you can't go into court and say, look, they recalled it. This is a substantial proof of right. a defect. You're not even, you're not allowed to do that. Um, and again, it goes back to what Josh said. You still gonna, are going to have to have experts to prove what the defect was and that right. the defect was the cause of the injury you're facing. If you're As facing you, one, get to a lawyer. That's the key here to yeah. make sure the lawyer knows what, what information can be admissible and what wouldn't be. And that's the, just a couple minutes left for the final question that we can get to. What should I do if I have been injured by a defective medical device? Yeah. First of all, seek medical attention. I mean, uh, it really depends on what we're talking about. If it's something, you know, all of a sudden uh, spontaneous, you need to go uh, seek medical attention, get well. Or if it's something that's a nagging or an issue, something like that, go see your doctor. Uh, he may already know that there's a problem. His other patients may know. Uh, so you certainly want to seek medical uh, uh, treatment and have everything checked out. And then, you know, you can do research on your own, but it's probably the best bet is to contact uh, an attorney that handles medical device uh, cases. You can go to the FDA's website, too, and you can actually search uh, components that you may have, whether it's a, a hip, a knee, a, a stent, uh, and you can determine what recalls are out there. No different than when you operate your vehicle, you can go to a website and you can determine if there are recalls associated. Real quick, less than a minute left. Sure, you, you can do that. If you, you are, you can go to the FDA website. I, I would say it's not that user friendly because you will yeah. need to know your catalog and lot numbers, That's which means right. you're eventually going to have to get your records. It's going to be at the hospital, the little sticker pages that Josh talked about because they take the sticker off the box. Right. You're going to need that to find out. Um, best thing I think is to contact an attorney and have your case discuss your case and they can make a decision yeah the, the key is just final thought um, uh, attorneys that handle these type claims uh, if you're concerned uh, we'll do an evaluation for free for you yeah. all you got to do is call and if you've got a, a, a problem or a concern with a component uh, they can do an evaluation for you for free and let you know if there's a recall or something else associated with the product you've got. Good uh, stuff, gentlemen. Good to see you. Right. Thanks thank so you. much, and thank you as well for being with us as we uh, wrap things up. Still ways for you to get in touch with the attorneys. Uh, find them on Facebook, search Hollis Wright and Couch, and on Twitter, it's Hollis underscore Wright. We appreciate you being with us, and we'll look for you next week right here on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright and Couch.